Taiwan. And I hand it over to our colleagues from uh, the UK. Thanks very much. Uh, so hello, uh, my name is Mike Bagwell, and I'm a principal analyst in the Defence Wargaming Centre at DSTL. And I've been at DSTL since about 2007. After several years working on defence, uh, secure, uh, the security uh, sort of policy area, uh, with a focus on deterrence, I joined DSTL's wargaming team in 2015, which later grew into the Defence Wargaming Centre. Within the DWC, my focus is on strategic gaming to focus on national security issues for senior leaders. And today we're going to talk about how we've used wargaming uh, with uh, national security type questions and how we've been striving to increase the analytical quality of those games. Uh, next slide, please. So first, a very brief introduction to the Defence Science Technology Laboratory. DSTL is an executive agency of the Ministry of Defence. Our purpose is to deliver high impact S&T for the UK's defence, security and prosperity by being the science inside defence and security. We supply specialist S&T services, which must be done in government. We provide expert and impartial advice, analysis and assurance, and we integrate S&T delivered by industry, academia, wider government, and our allies. Most of our work is from OD, but you can see that about 7% of our funding comes from wider government. DSTL is quite a large organisation and covers a lot of technical disciplines. We have 22 strategic capabilities with Wargaming sitting under operational research. Thanks, please. So James, Chris and I are all analysts in the Defence Wargaming Centre. In 2015, we gathered our core Wargamers together in a single team, and we've been growing the capability ever since in response to ever-increasing demand for Wargaming. Building on this, in December 2019, we launched the Defence Wargaming Centre. The DWC provides a focus to bring together expertise and technology from across the SDL, wider defence, industry and other partners. The DWC can be configured in a wide range of, uh, wide variety of uh, uh, formats to deliver different types of games for a range of sizes and purposes. The DWC, DWC is also intended to be a focus for research into wargaming methods, tools and techniques. Next please. So before I go further, I should make clear what we mean by national security gaming. In the past, we at DSTL have internally referred to these types of games as either strategic war gaming or strategic gaming. However, we believe the term national security games more accurately reflects the activities we undertake. Uh, so Elizabeth Bartels, whose work we drew heavily on in our research, uh, champions the use of the term national security gaming rather than war gaming or strategic gaming. To paraphrase her excellent dissertation, which is available on the RAND website, she suggests this term because it covers a broader set of areas like crisis management, acquisition, and other measures short of war that have major implications for national security beyond fighting major wars. It's also a more inclusive term for those in wider government who might find the term war both off-putting culturally and not an appropriate description of what they do. And we completely agree, so we're shamelessly adopting the term. The story of applying analytical approaches to national security gaming starts in late 2016 with a visit by our then Vice Chief of Defence Staff to the US to visit Deputy, Sec Te Deputy Secretary of Defence Bob Work. VCDS was enthused by what he had seen in the Secretary of State, Secretary Work's efforts to reinvigorate wargaming in the US and by how powerful a tool wargaming can be when used properly. Vice Chief's challenge to us was to consider how we could similarly reinvigorate wargaming within UK defence. Next, please. The challenge we faced was quite considerable. Although we'd never stopped wargaming in defence, indeed, we maintained a strong track record of wargaming at the tactical operational levels, there had only been limited use of wargaming to focus on national security problems in the past decade. Instead, we'd mostly used tables of exercises as the primary means of engaging seniors in scenario-based discussion. Now, whilst TITXs absolutely have their place and can be a really valuable method, we lacked an ingrained culture within MOD that saw the value of wargaming for national security challenges. That is, there wasn't a strong push for dynamic, interactive, multi-sided games where the players shaped the narrative and had to live with the consequences of their choices. Our sponsors didn't really see the additional value that these elements would add over and above what they were getting from TTXs, whilst they also recognised the significant additions in cost and complexity that go along with wargaming. We were also faced with a lot of myths and legends that had emerged over time about how decision makers, especially senior ones, would respond to playing in a dynamic, interactive war game. Some of our sponsors believed that seniors would resist being forced to make decisions, very specific decisions, or would not wish to see their decisions subjected to adversarial feedback. 
The scripted nature of T2Xs, the seniors were more familiar with, would allow players to discuss the issues around the scenario without committing to a detailed course of action. And that can be useful when we want discussion to focus on the nature of the problem, but it can lead participants to making unsubstantiated assertions that are not subjected to scrutiny, and there's some concern about how players will respond to this level of challenge. We also have concern about the risk that a war game might be seen as too stifling of conversation. One of the virtues of TCX is, is that they allow participants to go where they want to with discussions, and they can bring in whatever detail and nuance they need to because they're not constrained by any game mechanics. Our sponsors worried that players used to this kind of ability to zoom in where they wanted to would be put off by war games that impose more constraints on structure and what was discussed. Finally, we face concerns that decision makers would see games as overly reductive and view game visualizations, maps, counters, and so on as inappropriate representations of the complexity of, of the issues that they faced. So there's much we need to do in order to convince sponsors of the value of gaming at the national security level. We made a number of recommendations, and this is an abbreviated sample of the full set. The first was to establish strong leadership and governance for wargaming. One of the ways we suggested of doing this was to run a flagship cycle of senior wargames that would highlight the value of wargaming to senior decision makers and encourage a trickle down of enthusiasm to lower levels. It would also, we hoped, help us to overcome some of the received wisdom about how decision makers would engage with wargaming. We also recommended establishing a sustainable defense wargaming capability. This included production of a wargame handbook, which you can see on the right, which was published in 2017, and enhancement of the wargaming capability and capacity within DSTL, which ultimately led to the creation of the Defense Wargaming Center. Finally, we sought to develop an external engagement strategy that would help us develop and better access capability in industry and academia. For today, I'm gonna to focus on the first of these. Next, please. So in line with our recommendations, we were tasked with running a series of war games for senior three and four star players from across MOD, the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, Cabinet Office, and with colleagues from the US. In the first game, the Vice Chief of Defence Staff was our chair, and in the next, we had ministerial representation. I won't dwell on the details of these games today, but they were an important step in moving us towards taking more analytical approaches to national security gaming. As I've already mentioned, the objectives of the Vice Chief Initiative meant that our game objectives were somewhat in tension. We had to build some senior support for wargaming, we had to demonstrate the utility of wargaming to stakeholders, but we still had to produce useful insights on a real study question as well. So why were these intention? Well, because of the challenge we had with ingraining wargaming at senior levels, we felt we had to walk before we could run. And that meant we couldn't just launch immediately into running a very technical game with lots of complex mechanics. Instead, we spent a lot of time thinking about the player experience, ensuring the games were engaging, occupied the player's time well, and didn't feel like a drastic departure from either TTXs or the real world settings in which the decision makers would grapple with these issues for real. We were effectively trying to combine elements of a training game with an analytical game, which much of the law or gaming literature rightly notes as a bad idea. This naturally imposed limitations on how we could steer the designs towards answering the study question, and we had to make compromises in the designs to ensure our sponsors and the players stayed with us. The initial games we ran were seminar games that emphasised representing blue decision making in ways that sponsors and players would be comfortable with. And that was just about okay, as the study questions also tended to focus on understanding blue decision making processes and the decision makers' perception about the suitability of the tools they had and the capabilities at their disposal. In terms of mechanics and materials, we started Light Touch and got Light of Steel. And the picture on the right is from our first Vice Chief game. And you might just be able to make out in the picture uh, that we used counters from the Matrix Game Construction Kit, which some of you might be familiar with. However, while we were able to overcome many of the myths and legends of gaming with seniors, some of them really didn't like these counters and we had to hide them from the players in the next game. Next, please. So despite all these challenges, the Vice Chief Games were a success. Uh, they were able to provide appropriate and useful insights on the issues they were designed for. Things like the player's perception of their response options, their attitude to risk in complex and uncertain situations, and how the perceptions of threat differed across different organizations and government departments. We also succeeded in our other objectives. Despite the aversion to counters, we are mostly successful in countering perceptions about what senior players would be willing to tolerate, although we still need to be mindful of some constraints when engaging seniors, and I'll come on to that later. 
the Games were also successful in kickstarting interest in gaming across the fence and in wider government. Although we can't put all of this down to the VCS Games, we have since seen a much greater interest in wargaming for national security problems from a wide range of sponsors to different levels. So I think it's fair to say the games we designed were well suited to answering the questions we sought to address and also demonstrating the value of wargaming. But as we did more games and our sponsors became more ambitious, we found ourselves being asked questions that we felt our existing methods were less able to answer. In particular, questions around how the adversary might perceive or respond to blue strategies or the potential unintended consequence to blue actions. We found the methods that we had to hand and the compromises that we had to make to embed wargaming uh, at the senior level were stopping us from being able to increase the breadth of issues that we considered with national security gaming. So we decided to embark upon some research to address this. Yes, please. Last year, we conducted some research into how we could address this gap and produce methods that could answer more customer requirements. There were a number of elements for this. So firstly, we were looking at how we could continue the shift away from game design that provided experiential learning for players towards generating data for analysis. Our previous games tended to focus more on the insights that come from the players as they went through the experience of dealing with difficult choices in the game. However, there are limitations to how useful these observations can be, especially as players' observations might not take full account of the assumptions and choices that went into the game design. We obviously needed a view of what we meant by analytical gaming as it applied to the national security level, and James will tell you what we came up with. Um, we wanted to compare our thinking with best practice and allies in student academia, and there may be some people on the call who we spoke to. We're very grateful for the engagement that we had. Uh, we sought to identify the current barriers that were hindering our ability to be more analytical on our approaches, and we wanted to make practical recommendations on how we could apply all of this to future games. Next, please. So one of the first things we considered was what was stopping us from designing more analytical games. And we came up with quite a few factors. Firstly, sponsors we found composed quite a few constraints on analytical games in a number of ways. This could include micromanagement and interference with the game design. Even the best sponsors could find it difficult to set clear requirements often not articulating what they wish to know or achieve or why they think they need a war game at all. We also found that sponsors frequently overload our games with objectives. This could involve asking too many research questions, requesting the output to focus on too many different aspects of the problem, or requiring too many people to participate. They can also ask for too much in too short a time for us to really adopt a well-considered approach. The seniority of our players also poses challenges. The availability of senior players heavily limits the length of time available for game execution. The most we've been able to achieve in recent national security games has been about two days. In some cases, we've actually been limited to about four hours. This severely restricts the ability to employ complex game mechanics, conduct thorough adjudication, properly document the game, and give participants time to reflect on the gameplay and offer their impressions. I've already mentioned the issue of gatekeepers and skepticism. We don't get many opportunities to communicate directly with senior sponsors, and instead we find ourselves working with people who assume their seniors won't want to do certain things in games. Although we have most, we have uh, proven most of the fears uh, haven't really come to fruition, we have no degree of genuine skepticism, as I've already mentioned about last encounters and other mechanics that players can feel well reductive. Some of the issues I've described have driven us towards using scenarios, settings, and constructs that, that have led us away from analytical utility. Sponsors have often demanded choices in the game scenario, setting, and construct that restrict their ability to analyze the outputs. For example, they've tended to prioritize exploring blue decision making in UK ally processes. And because of this, we've often been driven towards representing Her Majesty's government's decision making in detail and providing comparatively little game time to representing red decision making in, in enough detail. Realistic representation of red and blue interactions can also be hindered by the provision of game starting conditions and mutually exclusive player objectives, which inevitably drive players towards conflict. Provision of overly confrontational and unchangeable objectives can give players very little reason or opportunity to change course and can disincentivize efforts for negotiation or compromise. Escalation in games can therefore often be an inevitable consequence of the game starting conditions rather than free player choice. And this could be problematic in games whose purpose is to study the potential escalatory or de-escalatory effects of strategies. In many of our national security games, we haven't made much provision for communication between red and blue cells. And that's often because the addition of negotiations between players could add significant time to a turn structure. So allowance must be made for players to formulate an action, engage in negotiations with other players, and then revise their planned actions in light of the discussions they've had. 
difficulties in documenting negotiation phases of the game can also create challenges for post-game analysis of why certain actions were taken and others rejected. However, this can lead to game sales taking actions which they, they kind of think speak for themselves for want of any opportunities to communicate. But as actions often do indeed speak louder than words, this can drive towards games uh, being rapidly escalatory. More broadly, we haven't spent enough time really thinking about the role of the red cell. In previous national security games, the blue cell has usually consisted of representatives of a number of different and potentially competing perspectives within MOD and across Her Majesty's government. This allows for complex dynamics and policy formulation and the compromises and inconsistencies that often result to naturally arise in gameplay. By contrast, red and other player cells usually consist of a small number of experts who are rarely given specific roles or asked to represent particular perspectives within the red decision-making apparatus. Available time, a lack of game mechanics and a lack of player roles also tends to favor the red cell rapidly reaching a consensus view. In some cases, that's a conscious design choice that reflects the adversary's more centralized control of government activity and a simpler decision-making processes. However, it can also reflect a lack of consideration about precisely what we want the red cell to do. The lack of representation of red policy making dynamics risks underrepresenting the factional interactions and constraints that can affect red decision makers and the constant interplay of organizational and interpersonal factors that might lead red to making suboptimal choices. So I'm now going to hand over to James, who will describe some of the challenges we face with analyzing the outputs of previous national security games. Thank you very much, Mike. So um, here, here I'm going to go through some of the problems that we found. Um, the, the primary requirement for our analytical research paper uh, was driven by the need to address the lessons identified from our previous games and fill the gaps in on our, our understanding of analytical gaming methods. Uh, one of the first things I identified was a need to identify genuine insights, uh, because in some cases, the insights that were drawn were from player observations, and these were clearly a direct product of the scenario and mechanisms baked into the game designed by the designers. Uh, this was a particular cause for concern in relation to insights drawn regarding the understanding of red actions and behaviors, uh, as the red cells in these games involved heavily abstracted versions of red decision making processes. And we're also frequently constrained by game processes and not allowed to have a, a genuine freedom of action. As game designers, we know that the dynamism of a game creates a perception that there is a strong relationship between the decisions taken by players um, and the responses and feedback generated by the game. However, we also know that this perception can be and, and often is false. Uh, and is generated from the participants having an incomplete understanding of the mechanical limitations of the game, as well as the nature of the uh, abstractions and assumptions made during the game design process. Next thing I identified was, was post-game analysis. And uh, in line with the fact that some of the insights were drawn from player observations, comparatively few genuine insights were derived from post-game analysis of data captured during gameplay, which can provide deeper and more robust insights than the initial impressions generated by the player and players themselves. The war game event had in some cases become and the end itself rather than a means to an end in terms of generating data for actual post-game analysis. The, the recognition of this issue also led uh, onto a requirement to address in more detail what sort of genuinely useful analysis uh, could be undertaken on highly qualitative discussion-based games uh, and what value this would add over the more straightforward approach based primarily around writing up the narrative. Additionally, looking under the hood showed that the adjudication procedures which uh, uh, generate the game's responses were frequently either largely prescripted um, or based on subject matter expert opinion and judgment. Uh, this often these were often elicited in, in short time frames and in highly uh, pressurized and time constrained situations. The lack of rigor in the production of these outputs inevitably interfered with our ability to analyze and draw meaningful conclusions regarding the game's unfolding narrative. Another thing we identified was appropriate data capture. So um, previous, previous games had not prioritized effective capturing of substantive data within their designs. Uh, this was partly a conscious choice on the part of the designers to focus on immersion and the experiential value that could be gained from the games, and so to not interrupt the flow of the game with intrusive data capture processes. However, this was also driven by a number of practical problems that stem from, firstly, the inherent difficulty of capturing qualitative data from chaotic interpersonal environments, and secondly, the practical problems posed by capturing such data from senior participants in highly classified environments without technical, technological support and in short timeframes. 
Uh, another one of the problems we identified was the employment of analytical methods uh, and meaningful post-game analysis. So data captured was generally qualitative and quite problematically of low quality volume and detail. Uh, it was therefore not particularly amenable to robust analysis, particularly in consideration of the limited timeframes we often have to undertake such analysis to draw meaningful conclusions. Uh, this leaves comparatively few genuine insights being derived from the post-game analysis of gameplay, meaning that these uh, primarily observational insights were not subject to a rigorous level of scrutiny. So the aforementioned issues led us to write a research paper um, to answer a number of questions we wanted uh, to answer regarding analytical gaming. So the first was, how is an analytical diff game defined? The second was, how can we develop games that are more analytical? The third was, how can we conduct more analytical national security games within the constraints we've identified of um, dealing with these very senior players? And the fourth was, how can we encourage more representative red cell, res red cell responses to blue cell actions, um, given that gameplay dynamics between cells previously proved to be unrealistic and unrepresentative, often by design, and were not amenable to this, this issue of um, you know, getting meaningful post-game insights. Uh, the next set of slides uh, is going to, in brief, outline our answers to some of these questions. So with regards to the first question, our definition of an analytical game is purposely very broad. Uh, we consider an analytical game to be a game that employs analytical approaches and or methods to generate insights as part of an analytical process. In this context, analytical approaches and or methods encompasses a rigorous approach to the generation of inputs and derivation of appropriate game mechanics during game design to engender greater confidence in the insights generated as well as the potential employment of an entire range of qualitative and quantitative methods when analyzing a game in order to draw some form of insight. What we're not saying is that the game itself is analysis. Instead, the game must be part of a process that includes analysis and the game itself must be designed so that the outputs it generates are suitable to be analyzed. To have confidence in the outputs generated by the game and the analysis we subsequently conduct on them, the game must be designed in a way which is auditable, where the rationale for design choices are clearly documented and related to the game's analytical objectives and rigorous underpinning data and understanding. Given this, uh, in the ongoing art versus science debate in wargaming, we tend to see analytical gaming as a science uh, that could and should be judged by objective standards, whilst also recognizing that there is a degree of art in all good game designs. However, we stop short of equating science and analysis purely with hard quantitative outputs and methods. Whilst these have their place, uh, as Elizabeth Bartels pointed out in her thesis, uh, a document which actually referred to quite extensively in our, our gaming report, analysis is often incorrectly treated as referring only to quantitative tools generally and operations research and systems analysis more specifically. So we wanted our definition to make clear that we do not discriminate between the insights generated from quantitative or qualitative analytical techniques, uh, as the types of games we run uh, to engage with national security problems often deal with wicked and complex problem spaces that are fraught with difficulties regarding the quantification of their outputs. Having defined what we uh, meant by the term analytical game, uh, we also generated a number of underlying tenets which we believe need to be followed if the game is to follow a coherent process of logical reasoning. Uh, most of these will be extremely familiar to wargaming pro professionals. Uh, and they were firstly the employment of analytical methods to generate insights. So insights from an analytical game should be to some extent the product of appropriate qualitative or quantitative analytical methods that have been applied to the data that was captured. Critically, an extension of this is that players themselves cannot generate insights. Any observations generated by the players need to be evaluated by the game team before they can be then classed as a valid insight. Uh, the next was uh, verification and validation of the game construct. So the game's construct must be subject to a process of verification and validation to ensure it is fit for purpose. Uh, and it, it provides an accurate and appropriate representation of the real world from the perspective of its intended use and that choices made during the design process are transparent. Game designers often produce a set of rules, but the processes and assumptions that lead to their creation are frequently captured with far less rigor. Uh, the next is uh, the generation of a data capture plan. So an analytical game requires an appropriate metric collection plan, which explicitly identifies what outputs from the game construct will be captured and measured, and identifies the appropriate methods to collect them. Uh, then there's appropriate data capture. So based on the plan, appropriate data must be captured during the game's execution to provide uh, analysts with a proper understanding of what transpired in the game. 
Then there's meaningful post-game analysis. So meaningful post-game analysis will be based on insights drawn from a comprehensive understanding of both what happened and why it happened as a result of the employment of analytical methods um, to the data captured. Uh, then there's generating novel insights. So post-game analysis of the game should produce insights that are not purely the product of the scenario and or mechanisms that were inherent part of the game design. And finally, there's generating additional questions. So an analytical game should also generate additional questions that will uh, go on to inform further research. In relation to the second question, we believe that generating more meaningful and valid insights from national security games can be accomplished firstly by suggesting improvements to the processes and methods we already employ in areas that are considered to be the science of gaming. And we would argue that um, in, general, in generally, these areas encompass um, the inputs which underlie the game's model of reality. So doing the background research, sourcing data, uh, understanding the theories for the phenomena you need to represent, um, and uh, you know, generating credible models uh, to explore the issues under consideration as, and you know, making sure that those models are indeed credible. Um, there's the development of the game's data capture and management plan, which is a document that should define all aspects of the questions to be answered, the variables and measures which will be employed, how data will be collected, and what analytical methods will be employed to derive the insights. Um, so data capture, which is uh, ensuring that appropriate data capture methods and processes are central to the game's design. Uh, undertaking post-game analysis of the data collected to generate valid insights, and then uh, verification, validation, and quality assurance. Uh, DSTL has produced a tool known as the Evidence Framework Approach for verification and validation and quality assurance, which can be applied to any war game. And I'm going to expand on this particular point in the next slide. So it's pretty clear that, that most of the points put forward on this slide are not actually particularly revolutionary. In fact, they're simply the application of best practice in game design, which has not really been fully applied in relation to our national security games. Doing so requires a mindset shift uh, on the part of sponsors, game designers, and players to draw a distinction between games with an analytical focus and those designed for experiential learning. Um, this will help see the value of adopting analytical approaches and accordingly accept, allow acceptance of some of the methods and processes that go alongside uh, with adopting a more scientific approach to game design. So uh, my colleague Chris is going to cover most of the improvements relating to the science of wargaming in more detail later in his presentation in relation to a specific case study of a game that we ran earlier this year. At this point, I am going to examine the issue of verification and validation in, in a bit more detail. So DSTL has internally designed and developed a verification and validation and quality assurance tool known as the Evidence Framework Approach. Uh, as a method of assessing evidence, the EFA is about practical way to think about evidence and improving analytical quality, and it provides a method to undertake an analysis estimate process. This process provides a means by which people can consider evidence and its characteristics and engage in a discourse about evidence utility. As a brief overview, the EFA comprises of three tables which are used for evidence assessment. The first is the evidence profile table, which is shown here. Uh, and this is used to assess the required or achieved quality of a body of evidence. Various factors are considered to be generic evidence characteristics uh, and are used to structure a conversation on evidence. For each factor, uh, the game team are required to make an assessment of the quality of the evidence and assign a profile between one and four, uh, with one signifying the highest quality and four the lowest. To give an extremely brief overview of the factors, um, comprehensiveness considers the extent uh, of the issues that, that have or will be explored and are relevant to the proposition being made. This provides an indicator of the breadth and depth of coverage and understanding attainable. Relevance considers the evidence drawn from a range of potential sources, um, like previous studies, literature, data, and assumptions, and considers their relevance for informing the findings regarding the current problem. Challenge considers the extent to which sources have been challenged and peer reviewed by both the study team and relevant in independent SMEs prior to wider exposure uh, of the findings to customers. Quantity considers the number and variety of sources for generating the evidence. Th that factor also includes an assessment of the methods employed to generate the evidence, taking into account the number, scale, and variety of approaches that have been used to tackle the problem. Finally, veracity considers the evidence in relation to the wider evidential picture, e.g. in terms of trends, patterns, and explanation from across all or the majority of methods, and the extent to which these form a supportive and integrative view, uh, and the extent to which alternate accounts for the findings may have been explored. 
The validation profile table is then used to assess or evaluate the validity of a body of evidence, allowing a judgment to be made regarding the extent to which the right work ha is being or has been engaged in, taking into account the purpose and constraints placed upon that work. The key output from this validation process is a judgment concerning the extent to which the work will be valid as part of an overall fitness for purpose judgment. The validation profile table factors are face, uh, which considers the extent to which the artifacts and supporting arguments for the proposition are considered relevant and plausible. Criterion, which considers how well the evidence relates to the proposition being tested uh, and the extent to which the work actually engages with the issues that it claims to. This is about considering the extent to which uh, the analysis has engaged directly with the relevant variables of interest or if it has used appropriate surrogates. Construct considers the adequacy of the gains mechanics in representing the issues under examination, and this includes the key factors to which they respond and the mechanisms by which they do this. Finally, content considers the extent to which it is possible to bridge the gap from data collected to genuine insights as a result of its breadth, depth, and granularity of the evidence that's collected. So stemming from these tables, there is often a need to express outcomes in more simplistic terms to provide an overall assessment of your confidence in the findings. The confidence assessment table allows you to cross-reference the outputs of the other two tables so that you to make a singular overarching qualitative judgment about your confidence in the war games findings using the confidence scale shown. So overall, the EFA allows us to critique and evaluate the evidence generated to provide an assessment of our confidence in the findings that can be communicated to the customer. It provides a method to clarify the strengths and weaknesses of the game's approach in a structured way without undermining the findings. Whilst it is very much a qualitative tool that produces subjective results, it provides game designers with a method of assessing confidence in their results, which is something that is otherwise absent, and is particularly relevant in a national security game context where the games themselves are also inherently qualitative. The evidence framework approach is a significant improvement over the view that games are an art which cannot be measured or assessed, which would suggest that any game that purports to be analytical in nature would ben and we would suggest, sorry, that any game that purports to be analytical in nature would benefit from employing the evidence framework approach, uh, and we intend to use it in all of our future national security games. So the primary use of the evidence framework approach as put forward by its original authors has been as a post-game assessment tool to evaluate the game's outputs. However, our analytical gaming research contends that to be truly analytical during the design and development of a game, uh, the designers need to have a method by which they can analyze the game's actual construct to help verify and validate it. As we believe that this is necessary in order to hold games to a, uh, at least a somewhat more objective standard. We contend that currently there is a paucity of analytical processes that can be applied to analyze the game's design in contrast to those that could be applied to the outputs post game. We believe that analyzing the construct throughout the design process would allow designers to objectively assess whether their designs are fit for purpose prior to the game's execution. At present, such assessments are generally a product of simple expert judgment on the part of the game design team, and it could be argued that they lack structured underlying scientific procedures, which would ensure objectivity. Identifying and applying such procedures would ensure that analysis is present throughout the game's life cycle. So we believe that the evidence framework approach can be used to help fill this gap. Our contention is that with minimal reinterpretation of the criteria put forward in both the tables, um, they're just as applicable to the construct and the inputs to under, underlie a game as they are to the outputs. And that uh, as the design and development process is in progress, the criteria put forward in both these tables can be used to assess the game design as it develops. At the start of the game design process, the team should perform an estimate on the level of uh, evidence required from the game. They should generate a series of evidence framework approach outputs, which uh, they would like the game to achieve with justifications as to why certain outputs are to be expected and should be achieved. Then as the game design process progresses, the team should schedule slots to perform evaluations based on the criteria that are outlined in this section and compare them to the initial estimates. The results of these evaluations could either inform the design as it goes forward, and if changes are deemed necessary, they will form part of a structured audit trail which explains why certain decisions were made. So the intent would be that this audit trail makes certain that the game actually engages with the issues that it was designed to, and helps to directly link the mechanics to the variables under study, whilst also allowing for the tracking uh, of the impact of changes to the design in relation to the criteria in the tables, and by extension, how our confidence in both the design and the game's outputs may develop and change throughout the game's life cycle. 
And I'm now going to hand back over to Mike to discuss the answers to uh, the next couple of questions. Thanks, James. So I'm now going to turn to the question of how we might conduct analytical games within the constraints of engaging senior players, which we've often had to do in previous games. And I should start by saying I've noted in the chat that Stephen Downs Martin has very helpfully put a link to his uh, Three Witches paper, which um, uh, we're very big fans of and uh, did draw in our analytical research. Um, so firstly, it's important to note that senior players can be important to answering some analytical questions. There really is no adequate substitute for gaming with seniors if you want to know how seniors will view and respond to issues. However, many of the constraints of analyt on analytical gaming we have talked about can be alleviated as senior players are not involved. So where the requirements capture process has highlighted that senior players are not required to answer the sponsor's primary research question, seniors should not be invited to participate. Now that sounds obvious, but it sometimes requires discouraging sponsors from inviting seniors for other reasons, like increasing exposure or buy-in in some of the work. Where senior players are considered essential to answering primary research questions, consideration should be given to how best to maximize the value of their inputs. In some cases, seniors might only be required to meet a subset of the research objectives. Now this might allow the spreading of elicitation of analytical insights across a range of approaches, each tailored to a particular aspect of the problem and only some involving seniors. This would help ensure that seniors' time is focused on the aspects of the problem they can most usefully provide input to, making best use of the limited time and increasing their buy-in to the activity. This approach helps avoid uh, designers avoid trying to force an entire analytical method or a very wide ranging method into a very short space of time or need to make major compromises in data capture and analysis to accommodate the constraints of senior engagement. This could be achieved by treating games as individual events within a wider analytical process. So rather than seeing a single game as a sole source of data for all the data required for analysis, actually trying to find data from different sources. Analytical approaches to gaming require a bit of a rebalancing as well between player immersion and mechanics that generate game outputs that are suitable for analysis. And both sponsors and players will need to accept more deviations from reality to better serve the game's analytical objectives. As I said, with seniors, we often try to prioritize their immersion. Um, but players' immersions and their perceptions regarding the realism of the game should really only be considered secondary to achievement of the overall analytical objectives. And whilst this is already standard practice at the working level, this does require a shift in the current approach when it comes to senior game design. It should be noted that a rebalancing towards analytical objectives doesn't mean that senior games should abandon all attempts towards realism and immersion. Generating useful game data requires that players behave in a manner that is representative of reality, and this often requires them to replicate their real world decision making. And immersion can greatly help with this. As previously discussed, senior players should only really be involved with analytical games because the game objectives require a senior perspective on the issues and decisions raised. And if the game is so unrepresentative of reality that senior gameplay is also unrepresentative of how they will behave in reality, then the value of engaging senior players at all is lost. Immersion and realism can therefore um, be an important prerequisite towards producing game outputs that are valid and suitable for analysis. But immersion and realism should be deprioritized where they threaten to undermine the game's analytical objectives. Since good game analysis often focuses on the discussions and thought processes that shape decisions as much as, if not more than the decisions themselves, failure to collect data on this has created a significant gap in the ability to analyze national security games. Greater emphasis in game design is required on how the required data will be generated and captured, even if this impinges to a certain extent on player perceptions of game realism. Sponsors and customers will need to accept that in complex games, capturing the data necessary to support thorough analysis will require a greater number of scribes, and they need to conduct themselves in a more active and at times intrusive way. Next, please, James. So as I've already mentioned, we felt we needed to generate red cell responses that were more representative of reality. Improvements to the representation of red in national security games requires consideration of what the proper role of red should be in such games. And the Caffrey Triangle reflects three different perspectives on how red cells should play. Firstly, cells could play to win. And this perspective that argue should, argues that red should play to win at all costs and provide the strongest possible challenge to blue. Red cells might instead be instructed to follow doctrine. Red cells playing in this way should play as closely as possible to how red is expected to behave in reality, strictly following red doctrine and cultural norms. Finally, red cells might be directed to play in order to simulate game objectives. 
Red cells here exist solely as a tool of the control cell, and their purpose is to stimulate required play by other cells in line with the game objectives. And we contend that in national security games for analytical purposes, tendency towards any of the extremes of the Caffrey Triangle risks producing a red cell which is insufficiently nuanced and representative to produce useful analytical outputs. At the strategic level, a red cell focused on winning at all costs only risks failing to take account of the factors that constrain decision makers, which can be a problematic gap in games like deterrence and escalation, where blue is trying to shape red's perception of these constraints. Lack of constraints on red behavior also limit the ability of games to discover how adversaries could innovate novel approaches to overcome the constraints that they're facing. However, a red cell that is forced to operate very strictly within the constraints of currently understood red doctrine is likely to be too constrained by current assessments and risks merely repeating conventional wisdom about red with no allowance for innovative thinking or new approaches to emerge through the dynamic interaction between two cells that are both determined to gain the upper hand. Finally, constraining red to meet game objectives risks denying them the freedom to develop what they consider to be the most appropriate responses and the opportunity to provide useful feedback on blue actions and strategies, thus negating the analytical benefit of gaming with interaction between live playing cells. In our past national security games held at the senior level, our red cells have tended towards the bottom axis of the Caffrey Triangle, balancing playing according to our current understanding of red with providing stimulation for blue gameplay in line with the game objectives. Stimulating game objectives has often been a top priority, with playing realistically and then playing to win being a secondary and tertiary importance, respectively. Although the precise balance between the three modes of red play will vary depending on the game objectives and methodology, we believe that in general red cells and national security games should seek a more equal balance between all three modes. Red cell mechanics and objectives should encourage a more competitive spirit and desire to succeed, rather than merely requesting a red perspective based on current assessments. However, this competitive spirit should be tempered by realistic and reasonable staffing conditions, objectives, and constraints. The level of control cell direction of the red cell, as seen in previous games that we've run, could be reduced if some of the other game design issues we've discovered uh, were resolved. At present, very few insights can be drawn about red's potential responses to blue actions because of the extent of control, input to their, control cell input to their activities. A degree of control cell direction to ensure that red cell play meets game objectives will still be necessary to keep the game on track. However, red cells must be given more freedom to respond to blue actions as they see fit. We propose a number of potential solutions to the problem of representing red in analytical national security games. It's important to note that the suitability of these suggestions will vary depending on the game objectives, overall design and other constraints. I should also be clear that these are proposed solutions for improving analysis. As the Caffrey Triangle makes clear, other types of game have different objectives that require different types of red cell. Uh, next please, James. So one option we suggest would be to provide all cells with equal weighting from a design, game time and resorting standpoint, and equal freedom to make decisions as they see fit. That is, to replicate in other cells the complexity of decision making in the blue cell in terms of the perspective represented and the freedom to make independent choices. However, such an approach would require a substantial increase in game time, both to allow all the cells sufficient time to formulate actions and also to adjudicate a complex set of unexpected activities. Such an approach would also create challenges for participants, both in terms of identifying sufficient quantities of suitably qualified personnel to role play in the opposing cells and in terms of finding useful activities to occupy them in the downtime between turns while their opponents make their moves and the outcomes are adjudicated. The red cell should usually be given objectives that encourage them to play in a manner that is situated between the corners of the Caffrey Triangle. Their objectives should include outlining their long-term strategic goals, which should always be more nuanced than simply defeating blue. Ideally, objectives would be based upon identified red strategic objectives and include many of the adversary's rural perspectives, interests, and constraints. This should include avoiding providing red objectives that artificially predispose them towards confrontation with blue, unless that is a key requirement of the game. In games which are trying to understand the circumstances in which red might escalate and what might determine them from doing so, we think the objectives should be carefully calibrated so that red doesn't feel either forced or overly free to escalate. Red objectives should also encourage players to balance their responses to blue with addressing other issues, such as managing domestic opinion or recognising the potential impact of their decisions on their relationships with other state actors. 
threat objectives should be grounded in as thorough an understanding of the real world adversary as possible, but they should leave over, open the possibility for modification, modification or reprioritization to account for circumstances or opportunities arising within the game. Such an approach might require acceptance on the part of game designers and sponsors that the most appropriate move in a given situation might be to do nothing or even de-escalate rather than continue aggression or escalation. As we discussed, game, object, game design should provide more opportunities for player cells to communicate with each other. There are many, there are many ways in which this could be incorporated into game design, and depending on the complexity of the structure, the need to document interactions and so on. One suggestion for allowing communications whilst keeping them manageable and recordable is to have a dedicated communications room. This could be neutral territory between the red and blue cells. The points in the turn when players are allowed to enter this room and the representatives of each shell who are allowed to engage in negotiations could be carefully controlled. And this might help mitigate the opposite issue of an overabundance of communication, limiting opportunities for misunderstanding and misinterpretation, and allow the players to conduct the majority of the deliberations away from the prying eyes of their opponents. Finally, the red cell needs to reflect the key roles and dynamics that are relevant to the potential adversary. In a national security game, it could be in some circumstances useful to ensure that both political stresses internally and external influences are well represented. This could be achieved by giving each Red Cell member different objectives for the specific role they are playing. Often this will mean that defeating Blue isn't their first priority, and they may even sabotage their own side to achieve their assigned objectives. This is particularly important when the Red Cell represents contending factions or groups that might resent Red success overall, such as criminal gangs or insurgents who do not agree with the main Red group. This can create factors and tensions that Blue could attempt to exploit. Some potential adversaries have internal and sometimes chronic tensions between services or between services and paramilitaries. A monolithic red cell will tend to forget these dynamics unless there is a reward in the game for highlighting them. Next please, James. So to give a recent example of one analytical game, and we put some of these lessons into practice, we recently ran a game to evaluate proposed strategic approaches for dealing with potential threats in a particular region. The war game itself was part of a broader analytical process. Strategic net assessment is itself an analytical process uh, that takes a long view of relative strategic advantages proposed by the UK, possessed by the UK in key competitions. It begins with a diagnosis of the current balance of advantage in a particular area. Then by asking how the environment is changing and how the UK, its allies and competitors are adapting, net assessment adopt, develops prognoses regarding the challenges the UK will face in supporting UK national security and it suggests strategic approaches for responding to them. The war game we ran sought to offer insights about the utility of these proposed strategic approaches, with the focus of the game being on the defence contribution to an overall cross-government strategy, with a particular emphasis on deterrence and compellence. So as it says here, the game's overall proposition that we set out to assess was that the employment of the specified strategic approaches will successfully contribute to the accomplishment of Her Majesty's government's goals vis-a-vis -vis a particular adversarial and allied actors in the selected scenarios. And I'll hand over to Chris, who will describe how he, as analytical lead for this game, approached the analysis for it. Uh, yes, hello. So as uh, already explained by Mike and James, analytical integrity was a key focus for the SNA game. Uh, to reference one of my favorite Sherlock Holmes quotes, it's a capital mistake to theorize before one has data. Insensibly, one begins to twist facts to suit theories instead of theories to suit facts. Uh, this is the attitude and approach that I took in the analysis lead role for SNA. In my opinion, it's not uncommon for analysts looking to make sense of the events of a war game to form a convincing narrative around what happened and why it happened. And this is often guided by their own preconceptions. The analysts then search the data generated from the game to confirm their assumptions. This top-down approach is what I attempted to avoid in the post-game analysis for SNA. Instead, I aim for a bottom-up approach in which the evidence would drive conclusions, not the preconceptions of the game team. Uh, next slide, please, James. So the journey to achieving this uh, can be called the road to analytical integrity and is made up of numerous stages. Ultimately, the research questions drove the analysis plan and then the analysis plan drove the data capture plan. Getting workable research questions for a war game is difficult, especially in the strategic sphere. Personally, I find that most war game research questions in this space leave me feeling uneasy. This is because they're generally broad and multifaceted. 
However, work should still be done to make them as good as possible, and the focus should be on ensuring they are specific, limited in scope, and realistically answerable by the game. Very broadly, the research questions for the SNA game were, could this strategy work? If so, could it be improved? If not, why not? And how can it be changed so it does work? And what, was there anything else notable that came out from the game? While the game team and I did work extensively to narrow down and firm up these questions, they were still fairly broad. For this reason, a number of building block questions with potential concluding breakpoints needed to be established and answered first in order to then answer the higher level research questions which the customer was interested in. Uh, next slide, please, James. To identify the building block questions which would need answering and what evidence would be needed to answer them, a mental exercise of what if was conducted. This is represented by the diagram shown on this slide. This is just a selection of the diagram uh, as the entire thing is far too large to fit onto a PowerPoint slide. So essentially this process involved considering all of, the all of the possible events which may take place in the game, what findings they would indicate and what evidence would be required to confirm these findings. Uh, next slide, please, James. So using the findings of this diagram, an analysis plan could be built. The formulation of the research question diagram led to the identification of the key questions we needed to answer. Uh, these, key question, these key questions were, was the desired end state achieved by blue? Did the players follow the blue strategy and was this intentional or not? If yes to both, was the blue strategy responsible for the blue cell achieving the desired end state? And did red, did red play according to the assertions made about them in the strategy? Once these four questions were answered, based on the evidence from the game, the foundations will be in place to answer the main research questions in an analytically integral way. Three separate assessments were created in order to answer these questions. These were the strategic end state assessment, the strategy compliance assessment, and the red assertions assessment. Put simply, the strategic end state assessment was a systematic comparison of the end state of the game with the desired end state outlined in the blue strategy. The strategy, the strategy compliance assessment was slightly more complex. Firstly, the key components of the blue strategy were identified from their strategy documents. Then the game team as a group went through every individual action taken by Blue within the game and judged the extent to which each play, which Blue action complied with the different components of the Blue strategy. If there was disagreement amongst the game team, the specific action would be discussed until a consensus was reached. The purpose of this was to assess the extent to which Blue had complied with the strategy being tested and to identify how different aspects of the strategy were more prevalent at differing stages in the crisis. Finally, the red, uh, the red assertions assessment was a comparison of the behavior of the red cell within the game with the assertions made about them in the blue strategy. The purpose of this was to ensure the red cell had acted in a way, uh, had acted in the way that is described in the blue strategy, meaning that the blue strategy was being tested against the advers adversary it was, it was developed for. Uh, next slide, please, James. By the analysis plan and these three assessments, I was able to identify the data that would be need that would need to be captured during the game in order to conduct these assessments and ultimately answer the building block questions. Essentially, the data capture plan was then built around the analysis plan, with the primary objective being that after the game, all of the evidence would be to hand when, as and when the questions arose. Uh, this worked really well, and during the post-game analysis, it was simply a play, it was simply a case of looking in the predetermined location on the data capture document for the evidence to answer the, question, the questions which arose. Uh, next slide, please, James. So, just to kind of give an example of this, um, let's say we've gone through uh, the and the analysis plan post-game and found that uh, the desired end state was partially achieved. Blue players did adhere to the blue strategy. Uh, the aspects of the end state that were achieved were due to blue strategy. Uh, the next question that would obviously arise from this is, uh, was the strategy followed by blue intentionally? So to answer this, the evidence that we would need uh, would be, were blue talking about the strategy during decision making? So was it consciously part of their thought process? Did blue think that they were adhering to the strategy? As it potentially demonstrates misunderstanding if they thought they were adhering to it, but they weren't. Were blue wholly adhering to the strategy again that may demonstrate a lack of clarity within the strategy and the blue cells understanding of it and did blue demonstrate an understanding of the strategy so when asked during the game could they characterize the strategy correctly because we'd already identified that we'd need this information in order to answer the question the data capture plan was designed in order to capture it therefore it was just a case of assessing this matrix of variables to reach an evidence answer to the question was the strategy followed by blue intentionally 
in this way, this interlinked analysis uh, plan and data capture plan makes it simply a case of filling the gaps with the evidence because the analytical legwork has been done in advance. Uh, next slide, please, James. So there is one kind of major issue with this approach, uh, which I've called the anything else problem. Uh, and there's always a risk with having such a structured data capture plan for a game that something significant but unforeseen may not get captured during the game because the data capture plan had not accounted for it. It's for this reason that we believe that two teams of data captures are required for an analytical game. One team to follow the data capture plan to the letter and another to capture anything else which appears significant. This should prevent the can't see the woods or forest from the trees phenomenon occurring. Uh, next slide, please, James. So there are some requirements that come with conducting an analytical games such as this. First and foremost is time, pre-game, in-game and post-game. The process of formulating the data capture and analysis plans uh, takes a considerable amount of time before the game design process can even begin. The capturing of data in-game adds additional time to each turn and the conducting of a comprehensive post-game analysis is also time consuming. This extra time inevitably makes the game more expensive to run. Similarly, um, more personnel are required before, during and after the game. And finally, suitable systems are required in order to capture and amalgamate vast quantities of qualitative data uh, at the same time. Overall, however, I believe from my experience that the benefits of a well-executed analytical game are certainly worth the additional resources required. And with that, I will hand back over to James to talk more about the actual design of the game. Thank you, Chris. So. Um... Given that we were looking at a strategic cross-government issue, uh, this was a complex and loosely bounded problem. So we opted for a multi-cell discussion-based game uh, structured around a range of specific questions that will be asked during the main game phases to generate structured outputs. So uh, the player cells represented uh, UK HMG, uh, the red, UK Allies and Partners, and other factors. Uh, which was the rest of the world. And the level of abstraction in the cell increased depending on its relative analytical importance in relation to actually answering the research questions. One of the design problems we encountered in, uh, or we encounter in national security games of this type is that the length of time each term represents, in, in this case, it was a month, is long enough that players can credibly argue that they would mid turn uh, be able to react to an enemy action. Effectively, a month is too long to wait to react to events taking place, and this compromises the realism of the game. So to address this problem, we employed the use of proposed actions generated in uh, phase one of the game structure. So in this phase, uh, the actions were only considered to be proposals, with the cells having the opportunity to modify or, ev or even cancel them later in the turn, depending on the outcome of phase three, the negotiations phase. After the negotiations, the cells could choose to then modify the proposed actions before finalizing them. In terms of an abstraction, uh, the knowledge of actions taking place prior to their implementation is explained as strategic indicators and warnings or information picked up by intelligence. Additionally, in the indicators and warnings aspect is critical for deterrence and compellence games, because if we only allow players to communicate via finalized actions, this tends to lead towards an action speak louder approach that is not only inaccurate, but also drives more rapidly and indeed artificially towards escalation. The proposed action solution accomplishes a number of useful things. Firstly, it is effectively a modified form of the classic wargaming action reaction counter action cycle that we undertake within a single turn. Uh, the proposed action represents the action part of the cycle. The negotiations allow other player cells to react, although through discussion rather than actually taking direct actions themselves. And this is followed by finalization where changes can be made representing some degree of counteraction. It allowed players to feel like they have been able to react to some extent to events before they had taken place within a turn, rather than following standard wargaming practice where actions are put into play and then the enemy's response comes largely in the form of their reaction in the next turn. We believe that overall this saved us time and actually allowed us to run the game successfully given that we only had two days to complete its execution. Uh, turns with this internal dynamic allow more useful analytical observations to be made within a turn because players do not need to wait until the end of the turn to begin discussing responses and compelling or deterring other cells from taking proposed courses of action. 
This meant that we needed to run fewer turns overall to provide useful output for analysis. So effectively, we ended up with a system where individual turns were longer than we initially anticipated, uh, being in this case about three and a half hours each. But we were still able to run two turns in a day, which is uh, in line with our experiences running most of our other previous national security war games. So clear negotiations and the actions finalization discussions were critical phases for data capture and generating an understanding uh, of the team's decision making processes for post game analysis. So putting into practice some of the lessons identified in our analytical um, gaming research report, we ensured that mechanically the red cell and the blue cell functioned identically. They had equivalent taskings, chose from the same list of actions, and had the same mechanics and structure throughout all five game phases. Objectives were geared to a crisis, but there was no inevitability regarding actual conflict breaking out. Otherwise, we could not actually answer our research questions. However, an identified shortcoming was the lack of diversity within the players of the cells. We attempted to uh, invite a wide range of thinkers, and we achieved a result that, on reflection, we considered to be better than our previous uh, national security games. But ultimately, it, it, to be frank, we didn't feel that we had in, were entirely successful, uh, as the majority of personnel were still from the same mold with uh, views that primarily represented the intelligence establishment. This is something we continue to recognize as a problem, and we know we need to do better uh, on this little account, uh, despite the practical difficulties of sourcing and assuring the attendance of uh, the relevant SMEs. So uh, a specific area of the game's design that I would uh, like to draw your attention to was the adjudication process. Um, a problem we have frequently encountered in previous uh, national security games is the amount of time required to undertake adjudication. Uh, when players, especially seniors, have no game relevant tasks and are simply waiting for the adjudication output, this places a significant time constraint on the adjudication team, who are expected to produce high quality outputs on a truncated timetable. The SNA game design provided us with a new way to solve this problem. In striving to be analytical in our approach, this meant that we had a much more comprehensive and accessible software based data capture solution that any member of the team could access in its entirety at any time. And uh, what we discovered during playtesting um, uh, that was that the adjudication of the finalized outputs was proving to be extremely time pressurized in, in phase five. But during the phase three negotiations, uh, the adjudicators were not required to undertake any specific or high priority tasks. And given that the cells had produced a set of initial proposed actions during phase one, we decided that the adjudicators time in the negotiations phase three would be best spent adjudicating the outputs from, from the phase one in order to alleviate some of the burden placed on the adjudicators at phase five at the end of the term. Uh, whilst we recognized that actions had the potential to be changed in later phases, testing demonstrated that a substantive proportion of the actions proposed in phase one were enacted in phase five either without changes or with only minor modifications. Therefore, we found adding an initial adjudication in phase three was extremely valuable in allowing us to reduce the time required to produce outputs in, in phase five at the end of the term. Additionally, the increase in the overall time now allotted to adjudication in combination with proper access to all of the captured data from which to make decisions significantly improved the quality of the adjudicator's final outputs, meaning that by the end of phase five, they could produce outputs of a higher quality and greater granularity than our previous national security games had actually managed. Uh, and I'm going to pass back over to Mike. Thanks, James. So having now put into practice some of our recommendations in a couple of customer war games, of which you just heard one example, we're able to reflect on how successful we've been so far and identify lessons for taking our drive to be more analytical in national security games forward. Firstly, I think it's fair to say that we have demonstrated that adopting more analytical approaches to game design has been worthwhile and has led to improved outcomes. Because we designed the games explicitly to look at them, we've been able to provide advice with reasonable confidence on issues we didn't feel able to before, in particular on things like how adversaries could view and potentially respond to UK strategies. This is in part because the changes we made to game balance and cell representation we re meant we had games which didn't inevitably lead to war, leaving room for deterrence and de-escalation strategies to be analysed without them being lost in the noise of an inevitable road to war set by the scenario, player objectives and cell construct. At a recent game, opposing cells, cli opposing cells climbed down from a very tense situation and negotiated a settlement to the crisis. And we were then able to explore strategies for consolidating success and building confidence in the agreed actions. 
And that's not something we could have done in a game that was artificially driving cells towards conflict. We've also been able to use analytical gaming research as a basis for more structured conversations with sponsors about the need to set more focus requirements and adopt a longer term focus that gives us enough time to build an analytical study with everything we need in place. Finally, we found that putting analysis at the heart of our game design has provided us with opportunities and helped us resolve issues that aren't strictly about analysis. For example, as James just described, we discovered the method we devised a centralized structured data capture that was essential for analysis of the SMA game also happened to be the key to allowing us to devise a more systematic and efficient adjudication method that allowed us to distribute adjudication in time and space across the game turn. Uh, next please, James. However, whilst we have unquestionably achieved success in our first few games, um, we have also identified a lot of ways in which we should improve. Firstly, whilst we've already improved how we communicate with sponsors, there is more we need to do to build their understanding of what sponsoring an analytical game entails and to set realistic expectations of what they will achieve with analytical games. And there are a number of aspects to this. Firstly, we need to be, continue to be clear about the time it takes to run an analytical gaming project. And that means building in enough time to a study to ensure that we have all the inputs we need, we have enough time to methodically design the game, properly play test, and allow time for post game analysis. And this is by no means a novel insight, but we recently found ourselves underestimating the amount of time we would need to thoroughly test our design and train the game team. And we must keep relearning this lesson. We also need to build understanding of the resources that are needed. Proper analysis doesn't come cheap, as Chris has already said. We need to honestly and clearly communicate that analytical gaming often requires more personnel than other approaches, more data capturers, potentially more adjudicators, and more people with qualitative and quantitative analysis skills to shape the design and make sense of what we capture. Clarity is also required about what inputs are required to a game. High confidence output outputs require good quality inputs in terms of things like the underpinning analysis that informs the understanding of the system of the study and the strategy to be tested. The assumptions being made about things like how cause and effect work in a given situation, what, com what capabilities will be in place, what perspectives and permissions will exist and so on. We need to be sure that a clear plan exists for ensuring that the required inputs are provided in enough time to properly inform the game design and the testing process. The focus of the game is another area where we have made progress but could do more. Here it's important to be clear with sponsors that asking for analysis with reasonably high confidence usually also means narrowing the focus of the game to a specific question or category of questions. We need to clearly spell out what that means um, sponsors won't get as well as what they will. That is, a game designed around a narrow focus won't necessarily be well suited to an answering seemingly related questions. It also means we can't easily combine analytical objectives with objectives around experiential learning for players, and we can't build games which try to simultaneously characterize a system and test strategies for operating within it at the same time. This requires a bit of a mindset shift on the part of those who would try to do everything with a single game project. Not only do we need to tell them that this at the outset and get them to agree to it, but we need to keep reminding them of the focus. They're not disappointed at the game itself, that the game isn't doing all the things that they imagined it would. Related to this, we also need to be clear what they will and won't get for the analysis. We need to be clear what questions we expect to answer and how and what we will not. Crucially, we also need to be clear on what limitations we expect to be associated with the analysis. How confident are we likely to be in it? What caveats will go along with it? How widely applicable will it be? We need to be sure to avoid the danger that analysis is used in ways that the underlying data doesn't support. There's only so much we can do to stop analysis being misinterpreted once we delivered it. But one thing we can do is ensure that the sponsor understands the limitations of analysis before we get too far along in the game process. And certainly before we hand the final product over. Let's please, James. In addition to improving our communications with sponsors, we need to do better at communicating to players and stakeholders. As we've already discussed, in many games and exercises that players will be used to, the game is about them. The event is intended to capture their wisdom on the subject or to educate them on a particular issue. The mechanics and structure of the game are therefore all about enhancing their experience. And as we said, whilst player engagement is important for analytical games too, our focus is on generating data rather than providing the most realistic setting or the most enjoyable and interesting experience to players. Although, as we said, those things are still relevant. We need to do better at getting players to understand what this means. We need them to focus on the task rather than wider tangents. We need them to stick to the mechanics we've designed, even if they seem unrealistic. 
because in a well-designed analytical game, there will be a documented, auditable purpose for every abstraction, even if it seems strange to players. But where possible, we cannot simply say, trust us, it's an analytical game. We must try to explain the rationale to the extent that we can for the mechanics and abstractions that the players will see, so they go along with us rather than resisting. And this will help with another point. That is, explaining to players that in analytical games, the meaningful insights come from analysing the game outputs, not from the self-identified issues of the lessons of the players. That means we need to be clear to players and stakeholders alike that they shouldn't overinterpret what they saw or think they can form a complete picture of the game and its meaning from their narrow viewpoint. Only when the analysis, which takes proper account of the design choices, assumptions and data used in the game is complete, can we form a picture of what really happened and what it's telling us. Again, this is a difficult mindset to change. We need to get away from people saying, I was at a great game today and it proved X, or this is the game, this game isn't valid because I didn't see anyone thinking about Y. Without the proper context, both statements can be equally misleading and damaging, but it's hard to avoid. Next, please, James, thank you. So we knew this from the outset, but our recent experiences have reinforced it. Rather than try to incorporate analysis into game approaches designed for something else, we must design games for analysis. Now, our recent games were designed with this in mind, and that's how we came to design games, as you've heard, which sought to overcome the pitfalls of imbalanced sales, unhelpful player objectives, and so on. But fundamentally, we were still trying to design the game within the familiar framework. A couple of days of gameplay with terms about a half day long, and so on. And we found it only partially served our needs. In particular, it didn't give us enough of an opportunity to capture the data that we needed to support the analysis that we wanted to do. So we might need to completely rethink our approach to game design. To start by thinking about the data we will need and how we will get it before committing to running the game in a certain way. And we need to explore ways of gaming that are quite novel for us. It could be by correspondence or a few hours a day spread out over a few days. As with everyone else, the COVID-19 pandemic has forced us to run games remotely. And along with the many, many challenges this has brought, we've seen opportunities too. Done properly, remote gaming might help us break out of our more traditional approaches to game design and come up with something that gives us more opportunities to capture more data and engage more people. Technology has a big role to play. We've had to learn a lot rapidly in the last year about remote gaming, but we're still in the foothills. Embracing technology can be difficult in government, where various factors make it hard to rapidly embrace new, technology, new developments. But we need to do more to explore the possibilities of technology, many of which we're already very used to uh, using in our day-to-day -day lives, can offer for enhancing data capture and engagement in games by a diverse range of people. Next please, James. So to sum up, we've come a long way in the last four years. We started with a drive to reinstate the use of wargaming to think about national security issues as part of a wider initiative to reinvigorate the use of wargaming in UK defence. And on this, we've been very successful. Our seniors were enthused about what wargaming could do for them as a decision support tool, and we have seen a strong growth in demand for wargaming at all levels. But we've also found that we were being asked questions that our approaches couldn't really address, and we recognised we needed new methods. So we undertook research into analytical gaming to understand what we needed to do to allow us to answer a wider range of questions with greater rigour and confidence. We came up with a lot of ideas, but we know we've only really scratched the surface of the literature and thinking that's out there. Nevertheless, we've had the opportunity to put some of our initial ideas into practice, and these have really highlighted the benefits to us and our sponsors of putting analysis at the heart of our game designs. But we've also learned a lot about how we could improve the design, delivery, and execution of analytical games in the future. More widely, we know we have to do much more to improve our thinking on analytical gaming. Our next area of focus is on the conduct of what we're calling experimental games, by which we mean those where we endeavour to isolate a single variable for study and keep all other factors constant. The big challenge we're currently grappling with is how to do this with the unbounded, complex problems that are inherent in national security problems. And when we've worked that out, we might come back and tell you what we came up with. And with that, I will thank you very much for your time and pause for any questions. Hey, Mike, thank you for your wonderful presentation. Uh, I have literally two pages of questions, so uh, we'll get right into it. So I'll bump around uh, in terms of chronological order for people who have put in their questions. Uh, try to you know, bend them thematically. Uh, but in the first thing I want to ask is that early in your presentation, you mentioned that uh, senior leaders and players can have a lot of resistance to games. Uh, and one of the things you that caught my attention was you said you had to hide the counters. Um, so do you have um, 
a knowledge or a sense of where that resistance comes from? Uh, so I think that part of it is people are not necessarily used to seeing the counters. And I think part of it is also uh, a sense of what the counters, counters look like. So I think certainly in the military area, people will be used to seeing NATO standard symbology on a map because that's part of their usual planning process. But when we're trying to represent non-military factors and we have to use counters as we do with matrix game counters that pictorially represent things like diplomacy and, and financial sanctions and what have you. Um, sometimes the way we choose to represent those can look a little bit cartoony. And I think sometimes people feel that that's a little bit, um, not quite the sort of serious uh, representation of the issues that they would expect in a, in a senior level of discussion. So I think it's a little bit of that. I think the other thing is that people, uh, senior levels especially, are used to having conversations around the table and, and not necessarily interacting with sort of materials like, like counters to, to shape their discussions. And so as soon as you start introducing things like that, I think it's sort of taking people away from the sort of their, what they're used to in, uh, in how they normally discuss these issues. So it's really important to have some of those representations of things people keep track, but we need to find a way of doing it, which doesn't immediately switch people off and make them sort of resist what they're seeing. Uh, fantastic. On that note, um, when you mention senior players and senior leaders in your games, do they play similar roles, I'm assuming, to their um, real day job um, to sort of represent that expertise, or do they assume different roles in your game? Um, so to date in our games, almost exclusively, our seniors represent their real day jobs. Um, that's, that's part of the reason we, we've engaged them is to sort of get their perspective from their position in, in whatever job they're in. Uh, of how they would deal with the situations that they're faced with. Um, that's also probably the easiest thing in terms of getting people to be involved rather than getting them to come and play in a more sort of general way. But there's certainly a, a, a place for that depending on the game's objectives, but we haven't really done that yet. Absolutely. Uh, James, could you go back to that slide with the, the um, confidence levels that uh, for analytical rigor? Yes, that's the one, exactly. So there was a bunch of questions about this one and the slide preceding it of how exactly you uh, this slide worked. So one of the questions is how do the, the two axes uh, engage with each other and how they come up with that score? Uh, right, so um, yeah, so when you, uh... Uh, when you're generating your um, assessments based off of the the categories here, um, each one that you produce, you, you you assign it a profile level as seen on kind of the right hand side, with with the lower the number being being better. So uh, obviously that these you then add up the score of um, of the two tables and each of them map to the uh, numbers on the uh, on the axes here. Uh, I did see a question that, that said that that pointed out correctly that the confidence scale itself doesn't have any numbers on it. Um, so the way you map for your result onto the confidence scale is is effectively through looking at the uh, where there is the overlap in the center center square of the two outputs. Um, you effectively have a uh, a tint of black in there, and then that tint of black maps itself onto the confidence scale. I think I actually uh, used the uh, the little. Um, color dropper to to exactly get what the tint of black look like in one area and find its correct uh, approximation on the confidence scale. Um, the reason for that is that the author of this very, very specifically did not want the confidence scale to be numerical or quantitative in any way, um, because that leads to very awkward situations where numbers become goals and things that you should match. And a quantification can actually, I think, be quite harmful. Uh, from that sense. Ultimately, the, 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 the intent of the confidence scale is that what's really important is the stuff that comes alongside it, ultimately. You know, you, you do get your medium to high or very high, or whatever it is, confidence, but really the, the, the real depth that comes from this is to then say, well, why is that the case? And that's then when you start referring back to your the content of your specific things and specific elements in order to kind of create a justification. That, that, and that's how it ends up really explaining to your customer um, what your confidence level is, um, and so that's kind of how it all how it all locks together. And I'm sorry if that wasn't immediately clear. I probably should have explained that slightly better. I hope that uh, covers the question. Uh, so going to the previous slide, real quick. So um, the number. So in essence, that uh, the numbers on the profile will be here, will be added, and then the, 
little spectrum graph at the bottom will be uh, the other axis as well, correct? Yes, exactly. So so if you look actually down the bottom of the table, you've got effectively your a, a smaller uh, single scale for your total here, which mm -hmm. could puts you in terms of just a validity, whether you're weak, moderate, strong, or high. Um, and that in this one, because there's four different categories, it's between obviously four and 16, because four is the lowest you can get with four ones. Uh, and then that then maps um, uh, onto the scale on the on the left um, of this. So, you know, you map your number across. All right. Uh, so if people have other questions with that, uh, I will follow up. But I have some other ones related to this is how, how do you distinguish confidence values for items on a negative slope diagonal on a validity slash warrant table? Sorry, can you repeat that? Uh, how do you distinguish confidence va uh, values for items on the negative slope uh, diagonal on the validity slash warrant table? Uh, I'm not 100% sure I get the meaning of the question, actually. Yeah, so I think, the, uh, correct me if I'm wrong for whoever put this question is, is that um, in this, I think we clarified it in the sense that the the bigger the number on, on some of these values is, is that the worse the value. I That's think that right. was the confusion. Uh, yep. Not that it's positive or negative in that sense. That is correct. Yeah, there are. There's no kind of negative per se. It's 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 just a simple case of um. Yeah, you know, you, you're the 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 least your weakest validity comes from if you have profile level fours across the board. In which case, you'd end up with a number sixteen, and it would be as low as it can be. And the scale goes from uh sixteen to four, four being the highest, which would put it up at the up at the top. Um. So yeah, there's no there's no negative in there. Absolutely. Um, so I actually want to follow up on a comment you just said about quantification being possibly uh, producing negative incentive structures, which is something we experience all the time, both at the university, but also in DoD uh, ourselves. Could you expand, expand on that a little bit? Um, so yeah, this is this is where I, I want to be quite careful because I'm not the actual author of the evidence framework approach and uh, I don't want to misrepresent anything that, that he would say. Um, I think that, that as it was designed, although there is some degree of quantification in, the, in terms of you have to pick certain numbers in order to, to give an assessment, for, it does force you to kind of put, a, put your flag in, in the sand at some point. Um, the the use of numbers, especially on the confidence, I think was considered to be something which would create kind of artificial goals or boundaries. And so when people were using it, they would be far more just aiming for a number and, and stating that like X number is acceptable and below X number isn't, et cetera, et cetera, um, which is just kind of using it in a method in which it wasn't really intended and and it's creating metrics which don't really have any meaning because uh, ultimately the, these numbers here don't actually have a specific meaning they are merely to allow you to to you know make a cross reference in using this uh, table so that you can give an overall sense of confidence but but the numbers themselves aren't something that you ever really refer to they just kind of are useful in order to actually uh, make the cross referencing process work yeah, absolutely. We have the same issue here in the States. Like uh, we have a, a war gaming repository that um, the DOD sort of uh, manages. And at one point they rewarded funding or um, graded higher games on number of insights they produce. So what happened yeah. is that insights all of a sudden multiplied in the following years, right? Yeah. 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 Reminisc <laughs> yeah. And uh, I would, I'd also add that the point isn't to say that low confidence is bad as well. It's simply to acknowledge the limitations that your design has. Um, so, you know, a lot of our more qualitative games and a lot of national security games end up with confidence that actually sits more around the medium level. Because, of course, the systems that we're trying to look at have these, these are very complex. And so our ability to represent them in a way in which we're confident that that representation is accurate is obviously limited. And it has to be by very nature, like it is extremely difficult for a, a more qualitative based game in a wicked problem space to achieve a very high level of confidence. But that isn't a problem. And, and that's that's, you know, again, where numbers could be could be an issue, you know, that that is only to say that, you know, you you must be aware that potentially further evidence come out that would change your findings and you know that they have they you know they they it's difficult to say that they have a strong validity and a strong warrant as well so 
So shifting gears a little bit into, into data collection and your analysis plan is, uh, do you guys do any training or preparation for your repertoires or note takers uh, in ahead of your game? Uh, so I'm happy to say this one. Um, previously, uh, from my understanding, the answer to that would be no. For this game, we did. Um, and a big part of that was simply familiarizing um, the data capturers with uh, the data capture plan and to uh, really kind of uh, make explicit to them the level of detail that we that we were looking for and also to sort of reinforce the point that while you can write something down um, in shorthand on the day and think you'll remember it two or three weeks later uh, when someone else comes to look at it they need to be able to make sense of it uh, without that uh, so yes, in that sense, um, I would love to be able to do far more structured training. Uh, but I think the main thing that we, or that I learned from this was it was about ensuring that your data capturers understood what you were looking for in the game, because you can often get people who are coming into um, a game who have their preconceptions about what's important data. And for something like this, um, specifics of geography uh, down to the exact kind of uh, town or whatever something's happening in isn't actually particularly important um what's far more important is 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 uh this idea of deterrence and all that kind of stuff that we were trying to capture uh so i think that that was the most important part of the train that we had for this game was uh just getting buy-in from our data capturers and making sure they fully understood what we were trying to achieve from it Absolutely. Um, there's never enough time in game design. I found I found that time is always the least and most scarce uh, resource for design teams. Uh, so to follow up on that question is to sort of revisit uh, Q4 uh, in the sense of uh, the question, in the sense of what was the, if the analytical purpose of the game is to understand how real world adversaries could defeat us, and we don't have a good understanding of them, how do we ground these objectives? And they have they put the reference to Q4 as the slide. So this, yeah, this is a really interesting one. Um, and that is why we conducted the uh, red assertions assessment, because ultimately uh, the game, uh, the purpose of the game wasn't to to test that, that the red that was described in the strategy or the red that the, the strategy was built around uh, is accurate. That, that wasn't our place to answer that. But what we did is assess that the red that played in the game was consistent with the red the strategy was designed around. So we can say, if your assessment of red is correct, this strategy will or won't work. But what we can't answer is, is your strategy, is your assessment of red correct? So that was sort of, it, it's, it's a slightly kind of woolly answer because it, it ultimately is we can't answer that question and, and our entire analysis is dependent on that. But, but we've done our best to validate our analysis within the strategy that you've given us. Just to add to that, I think we have to be really careful about how, as I, as I described, how we think about red. So we want to make sure that we're representing red in a way that uh, uh, matches so to a certain extent what our intelligence community think is a, is a reasonable representation of red, but also we don't want to constrain people to that because we don't want to end up sort of repeating that received wisdom back to players and, and only really validating a game against a sort of one fixed vision of red. So we have to give red a bit of freedom, but we also have to understand what that freedom means in terms of our ability to analyze the outputs. Yeah, and, and if it came out that actually we had a load of red experts in the game and they didn't play in a way that was at all expected by the strategy, uh, that would have been fed back to the customer because um, clearly there, there, there's some misunderstanding there whose part that, on, whose part that is on um, would be up for them to decide. So does the, does an identical red cell slash blue cell allow for potential of giving them slightly different goals and objectives in order to simply, or in order not to simply mirror image the two sides? I think it depends on the identical objectives of the game. There will be times when giving players identical objectives will serve the per the identical game objectives will serve the analytical objectives. But I think there's no reason why 
setting up the cells to have the same kind of makeup, the same kind of decision making time and so on. It doesn't mean they have to have identical decision making um, objectives in exactly the, exactly the same way in all games. There can be times when those objectives are more tailored to our understanding of what we think reds perspectives might be, what we think their objectives might be that differ from blues. And so, yes, absolutely, in some games, whilst everything else being equal, we might vary the objectives given to each side. Absolutely. Um, so one of the other things that we want to sort of go back to is sort of your uh, adjudication method. Um, there are some questions about what interactions specifically were adjudicated in terms of low resolution combat or were these Paul Mill policy responses? I know you guys may have been talking broadly across uh, uh, several games, but uh, is there an example that you can sort of give us in terms of how the adjudication worked in terms of these dynamics and inter uh, interactions? Uh, so I can say something general, and James and Chris might want to come in with more detail, but generally in most of the national security games you run, we're talking about pole mill level adjudication. We don't tend to try and build in resolution of combat into those games in a lot of detail as well. And that's really trying to make sure the games are focused at one level, or we don't want to have a really complicated game which builds in tactical level interactions of, of players, as well as that pole mill context, just because it becomes very complex and unwieldy. So when we talk about adjudication in our national security games, we're mostly talking about about that quite qualitative uh, pole mill level of interaction. Uh, yeah, another reason I like the term national security rather than strategic is because strategic, calling a game strategic is very difficult because immediately people start to think of the military strategic or military grand strategic spheres um, rather than the cross government elements. So having a different term I think is quite useful because it helps break people out of that mental paradigm. Um, and of course, in, in a military kind of strategic or grand strategic game, you would almost certainly have a map with those kinds of counters on it. Um, so, you know, we 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 needed an adjudication method that was was actually very very broad because we knew that the kinds of with what what we had done is we had built um, a list of actions that the players could take that was across the entire diamond spectrum, um, and in each area, you know, there was kind of 10 or so quite quite high level descriptions of actions they could take and they had to select from that list the actions they were going to take each turn and then answer a series of questions about those actions um and so we had a for, for each thing that was selected we had a particular question list that they went through which kind of was like why have you selected it what do you expect that, that selecting it will achieve etc cetera, etc cetera. so we really got a sense of what the intent behind this was but also um quite cheekily for adjudication purposes we specifically asked them you know what, what is it you want this to achieve and that meant that our adjudicators could rather than having to answer that question themselves already had the information down there um and if they thought that what they action wanted to achieve was reasonable they could sometimes just kind of wave it through you know they almost got the players to do the adjudication for them in asking them what is it that they wanted um the way that that and i'm talking specifically about the example game that we're kind of talking that we mentioned here because there's there's a number of games that, that we could talk about that things are done slightly differently in um and so it was all question and discussion based in terms of what you're doing while you're doing it where it is etc uh someone i saw someone ask the question of you know can we see the maps and counters and stuff from that game and the answer is you've already seen them because there wasn't any um it was entirely narrative and discussion based uh, I, I freely admit that initially we intended for there to be more materials and some of the technological issues of working remotely um, meant that we kind of just couldn't make them work properly. But actually, having now done it, I don't really think that they were particularly necessary and that they, they it, it, we didn't feel like we lost very much without it uh, as long as we made sure that the, the post adjudication briefings were comprehensive enough that people understood what was, was going on. Um, I'll stop there. Uh, yeah, just to oh, go ahead, sorry, Chris. Sorry. I, I just to add to what Jane said, um, I, I was terrified uh, when it came to the post game analysis that once all of the actions had been kind of disentangled, that there was going to be a lot of stuff that didn't add up because we didn't have counters and we weren't sort of keeping track of, of, of where forces were. But it, it just wasn't an issue, uh, which, which was a big relief. So on that note, uh, were there no counters uh, for the players or at all, either even for the control cell? 
Uh, in this case, there were no counters at all. Uh, in some in some other games, we have had it, um, as described, I think, where we've had counters with the control cell kind of hidden in the background, but the players didn't get to see them. Uh, in this case, we we eventually decided that we didn't think wait they need them, uh, and that turned out to be to be true. I think everyone's situational awareness seemed to seemed to hold up, and we didn't seem to have any issues uh, or any substantive issues on that front. I'm sure some people would have liked a map with to to to, to help. But um, it didn't seem to cause us any significant problems, actually. It's worth noting that when we say no counters, what we really mean is no visualizations of what was happening in uh, in the game, or sort of in terms of what was on the map, etc. It wasn't purely uh, sort of an unbounded seminar game in the sense that there was still uh, uh, there were still constraints on how players could play, what kind of actions they could take, how many actions they could take in a turn, and so on. So we just didn't represent them with counters on the map. So, so we still had mechanics um, that governed what players could do and just constrained them in some respects, but we didn't visually represent it because of some of the constraints that we face with remote gaming. But, but everything but the visualizations were there. Yes, uh, the last past year in uh, the virtual environment has been a challenge and a period of both uh, angst and growth for many of us in the game design realm. Um, so I completely sympathize on that. So another question sort of shifting to the content uh, and gameplay of the games is, does your design explicitly avoid or exclude as a side effect de-escalation after kinetic uh, conflict or escalation has started? Uh, so again, this, this depends on um, the particular nature of the game. So the one we briefed was with uh, the net assessment example. Um, we weren't ruling anything in or out really. So we wanted to know um, it, as a strategy for sort of avoiding escalation, whether or not that was, um, there were reasons to suppose that might work or not work. So escalation or de-escalation was, was all fine as far as what the players did. Um, we wanted to make sure that um, whatever they did, we were able to understand why that happened and how players followed up on that. Absolutely. So circling back to a topic that James quickly mentioned about counters and maps, um, and also at the same time being sensitive to you know, I mean, uh, the topic that you guys are, are exploring in these games is, can you talk about any of the general mechanics of sort of like how were actions submitted? Was it, you know, for example, like, was it submitted by PowerPoint? You know what I mean, was there a specific template they filled out? Um, you know what I mean, uh, how did you sort of can you paint us a picture in terms of some of the game mechanics, uh, even if it's devoid of like actual substance? Uh, yeah, so um, using using the the student assessment game as as a, a kind of continuing example there. Um, so I, I, so firstly, they effectively had a certain amount of time in which they could do up to I think three actions. And they had there was a restriction on kind of resources that they could spend. So you know it, it was kind of related to real world constraints of you can only do so much within a certain period of time because it's it's, it's a, a month long term. Um, so uh, they picked actions from a list, and then we had a very specific set of questions that we asked them about the action, ranging from what it is, why you've picked it, where it's happening, um, and and ask, and we went through that list. It was very very structured, um, and so by the end of it, we had a very comprehensive narrative description of what it was. So they didn't have to fill out any forms. We have found previously that getting people to fill out forms leads to extremely varying levels of quality of of the returns. Um, and that can be quite problematic because in post-game analysis, you, you don't have consistency between what you're seeing. If you have a very good player, very active, you know, they might fill out quite a lot. And if you've got someone who, who is not so interested, then, you know, you may be missing a lot. So we, that kind of gave us almost kind of an internal quality assurance in that the facilitator was asking the questions, data capture was taking them down and the data captures were very much empowered to butt in and kind of say, okay, explain this, expand on this. I don't think I've got enough detail on this. So that by the end of that discussion process, which was normally about 15, 20 minutes for each action with the group, the data capturer gave a thumbs up saying, you know, I have a detailed description of this action and exactly what it is and where it's happening and what it's intending to do. Um, and that was all written into, uh, uh, into a OneNote, which everyone could see because OneNote usefully means everyone can, can access the same thing at the same time. Um, so, the adjudicators had instant access to that, which meant that they they could see exactly what was going on. Also, the adjudicators were in the room at that point in the time as well. They weren't doing anything in terms of interacting very much. Um, they had one task, which was to make sure that the actions proposed were actually reasonable. Um, we didn't want to get to the next stage of the game and then have the adjudicator just say, no, this just doesn't work or, you know, 
what the, inte the effects they're intending to have is completely nonsensical. Um, so the adjudicator was there in the room to make that challenge at that point in time, at which point the, the players could choose to go ahead or not. But if they had been told by the adjudicator that it wasn't very credible what they wanted, and then at the end of it, it came back where they didn't get what they want, it felt like they'd already been primed for that. You know, they, they would have had to have proceeded against the adjudicator's express kind of questioning of, of their intent. Um, I hope that kind of answers the question and gives you enough detail. Yeah, absolutely. So sort of going on transitioning to the, the notion of data capture, right? So most war games uh, rely on repertoires or note takers or you know, a collection cell physically in the room or virtually in the room to take notes, right? On particular topics or themes or actions. Um, so given those sort of, you know, I mean, uh, the variable between the quality of note takers, right? Um, have you guys considered other techniques like voice to text capture and other uh, sort of data collection, like collecting chat uh, chat information from um, like Zoom sessions, right? For example, right? Um, have you guys considered that or is that you know, a non-starter for you? James? Uh, I'll have to tell you this one. That is, uh, oh, James. Uh, you you, uh, you so I, start off, Chris. Yes, yeah, so, so during um, the sort of design process for this, uh, Yes, we considered it, or at least I considered it. Uh, I know me and James discussed it at length as well. Um, I, I think the issue is is that problem of having too much data, right? So, like, if you've got two days worth of free flowing conversations between twelve or however many people are in a cell, um, just making sense of that is going to take so long, and breaking it down into anything remotely usable. Uh, so that is the biggest hurdle. Is there are there potential ways around that? Are there bits of software that can do um, text analysis and things like that? Yes, uh, I'd love to try them. I'd love to see how they work, but it's definitely uh, very very early stages. Yeah, I mean, I have I have yet to see a voice to text tool that really works in a wargaming environment. Um, I, I, they may well be out there. Others may have them, but but uh, I, I have yet to see one that, that has kind of convinced me that it is, is really credible. Um, uh, I have recorded entire war games before and then transcribed their data, and it was a multi-week process that was very laborious. Um, so we, it is difficult because if you I'm sure those of you who are who are familiar with data capture, it's also very easy to go in down the information overload route. You know, if you're actually trying to record everything that happens and transcribe it, etc., you you end up capturing an awful an awful lot of data, which is actually quite hard to analyze um, in terms of time and effort. It's not that you can't do the analysis; it's the it, you, the juice really needs to be worth the squeeze on on that kind of data capture and often a more kind of well-considered structured data capture approach, I think gets you, you know, most of the way there without, without, you know, burdening, overburdening you, so. So uh, Tom Fisher uh, recommended otter.ai uh, in the chat, if you guys are interested, but I also understand that there are definitely infrastructure and you know, quality control issues in terms of recording sessions, especially if you're in person. Like if you record virtual sessions like this on Zoom, it's much easier. Uh, but if you, when you're in a room where acoustics sort of matter and you're getting pieces of conversation, um, it can be uh, problematic. And I say this as someone who used to be the person in charge of uh, transcribing some recordings and it was a, a special type of hell. Uh, to say to say the least. Um, so on that note, uh, given however you collect your data, whether it be re through repertoires or you know, I mean uh, narratives or other forms, um, how do you guys uh, you know convert this into this uh, analysis? And where does that analysis go to after you finish your game? Chris, you want to say that one? Yes, yes. I was just, I was thinking, I was taking the time to think of my answer. Um, <laughs> uh, so, uh, as I kind of ran through in the presentation, um, we've identified uh, these uh, we term variables, um, which are the bits of evidence that we feel we need to make a uh, an evidenced uh, judgment on um, uh, different questions and potential different conclusions, um, where it goes. From that, uh, it turns into a report, um, but 
I, I, I'm not sure if there's more you want me to expand on on that. Yeah, so you know, in terms of, we often refer to the cycle of research, right? Uh, Peter Pearl's concept, and the notion is like, for example, uh, where do uh, your your game reports and such go to? Does it go to a, a MNS shop? Does it go to a policy shop? Uh, so, what does that sort of cycle look like for you guys? Where you guys sit at DSTL? So it really varies again on the on the question. So sometimes our results go straight to a policy customer, and they will decide how to do that. They they how to do what to do with the information. They might integrate it into other analysis of commission from elsewhere. They might uh, use it directly for decision support. It really depends on what they've asked us to do. But in other cases, um, our, our our games will inform modeling and simulation and other kinds of analysis that might be done within DSTL, uh, perhaps a bit less so with national security gaming, but there are times when some of the broad insights uh, from a national security level game might use, be used to inform some of the assumptions that go into lower level games. Uh, so it really depends uh, as to where it goes uh, for, on who's asked us to do it and what they've asked us to do. Sorry, that's a bit how long's a bit of a how long's a piece of string out, so I do apologize. Hey, no worries. Um, so another quick uh, so another quick question in terms of DSTL's wargaming effort is um, so some uh, some people in the uh, audience want to know that uh, is Paul Mill gaming something new that you guys have adopted at DSTL um, or uh, due to sponsor requirements or uh, something you guys are trying to explore yourselves or mainly because DSTL has always been known as a science and technology organization. And um, normally you would associate that with like S&T concepts or gaming. Uh, could you go a little bit into that? Yeah, so first things first, DSTL is a really broad organization. We have a lot of different capabilities uh, of which policy analysis is, has always been one. Um, and we also have a long history of doing uh, as the poll mill sort of uh, issue, considering polymer issues uh, for various customers, um, what's a bit newer is applying, national, is applying gaming to those issues. But um, our customers, as I said at the beginning, are, are not exclusively MOD. So we also work for other departments across government, and we also do work for, for some of our allies as well on occasion. Uh, and even within MOD, our seniors want to understand how their strategies um, and device they're offering integrate with that being provided by other government departments at the national level, where really the military instrument is but one of several different ways in which decision makers might consider grappling with an issue. So it's understanding how the military contribution to, to national, national policy making kind of functions and, and what sort of challenges and issues decision makers inside the MOD need to think about as they do that. So it's very much within our remit to do poll mill, uh, to look at poll mill issues and we're latterly applying gaming to it where we've used other techniques in the past. Perfect. That's great. Um, uh, so two sort of questions in terms of national security gaming and the type of players you guys get. Uh, one of the big themes you guys have mentioned in your game it, or in your design is sort of whole of government approach, right? A broader set of just beyond MOD perspectives. So um, how have you guys or how has it been trying to get buy-in and stakeholders and players from across the government uh, to participate in your in your games, whether it be S and T or Paul Mill games, uh, writ large. Uh, it varies. I think so. I think we've had a lot more success. I think, as I, I mentioned earlier, some of the first games were really important to getting people to understand the value of what we're trying to do, and 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 some of the assumptions that go into a game, how a game is used, and what kind of output it produces. And having done that, I think we have had more success in encouraging people to to get involved. We have more of an acceptance that this is a useful method for exposing assumptions and then raising challenges and getting people to think critically about some of the strategies that they're employing. Um, there are always going to be variations in personalities and perspectives, and not everyone's going to be uh, necessarily a fan of gaming. I think we all know that, that, that there are people who will have their concerns about what gaming does and uh, um, how people use it. So there's always going to be a few people that, that we, we struggle with engaging across various departments. But for the most part, I think we've had a lot of success in getting people to really buy into this. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, so on a related question, um, someone wanted to know is, is DSL drawing from allied countries to take part in DSTL uh, war games for your know, new perspectives or new sort of uh, your know, expertise? Again, it really depends on the game, but where, where sensitivities allow, we do try to bring in other, uh, other allies. Um, as you might expect, predominantly we we draw in the US uh, um, expertise uh, for a lot of our games, but we also do draw from other allies and partners as well in various games. 
but obviously there are games where that's not possible as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm just waiting for one of my invites. Uh, I know the last one probably got lost in the mail. Um, so yeah, that's right. <laughs> yes. So as we are closing up on the end of the hour, um, there are a couple of questions I will reserve for myself to end out the session. Uh, one is, uh, it's, it was one, it was fantastic for having you guys uh, sort of talk about uh, the UK sort of and DSTL's wargaming effort. Um, is something that we do not get to, uh, get enough perspective on here in the States. Uh, we tend to be very American centric uh, in a lot of our studies and writings. So it was a pleasure to have you guys on that. So are there any uh, initiatives or you know, I mean, um, ideas of how you guys are going to move forward, moving forward, engage in uh, other types of uh, gaming beyond analytical gaming, for example, like educational gaming for the British Army? I know the UK Fight Club is a very big thing there. Um, or just sort of in public engagement, there's been an uh, increased number of use of those kind of games here in the States. Uh, so firstly, um, thank you very much for the opportunity to present. Uh, it's been really important to us to have this kind of engagement with, with various experts as we thought about our approaches to this. And, and so being able to sort of offer our thoughts back has been really valuable. So we're really grateful for the opportunity. Uh, in terms of where next, um, yeah, we have some more thinking to do with analytical approaches. Um, educational um, areas, it's, that's, that's where it's starting to cross over into, into um, areas where perhaps other people have more of a remit than us. But DSTL are involved uh, in Fight Club and uh, do in, indeed uh, also uh, uh, contribute to that in, in various ways. So um, there, there's, there's, there's more to do there as well. In terms of public engagement, I'm not quite so sure. I, I'm not sure what we have a, a, a plan for that. But we do um, obviously have a connections conference uh, in the UK. And as part of that, we have a wide range of people from uh, attending from both industry, academia and uh, and other sort of enthusiasts from the public. So where we have a really good opportunity to engage with lots of different people and, and showcase some of our methods. So there's always that. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, on that note, I believe this year's Connections is in September 14, 15, 16, which will be virtually. Uh, I will plug uh, their efforts. And this year, I think the focus is less on lectures and sort of webinars and more on experiential activities and like workshops that you are working and doing uh, more interactive, I think is the theme of this year's Con uh, Connections UK, uh, which I always enjoy attending. Uh, moving on to sort of the last question for each of you uh, as you guys leave. And this is a question that we've been asking all of our webinars sort of uh, guests uh, this year is if you had you know, no limitation in terms of funding or organizational resistance or whatever, like your Moses and the Red Sea is parting for you at your feet, um, whether this be a personal game, game project or a professional one, uh, we always like to ask, what is your dream game, a game that you want to design or be part of or I mean, come to fruition? Um, and we'll start with you, Mike. Well, so I want um, a week of seniors time where uh, they don't do anything else. And we can spend a lot of time really asking them lots of detailed questions and, uh, and uh, really getting into their thinking. I'd also quite like it to be um, a game which uses lots of technology, lots of lots of opportunities for data collection and more innovative collaboration. People using, uh, like, as we discussed, Zoom conversations and, and the rest of the things going on, which we can which we can data capture as well. Um, but that is a bit of a dream at the moment. You should have asked for a month. I might as well dream big, Mike. Uh, <laughs> that ain't high just, enough. Just collect their phones and laptops. Uh, tell the aide de camps to go home. Uh, James? Uh, yeah, very, very entertaining question. Um, I, I mean, part of me just wants the time to do it properly, like really properly, you know, from, from start to finish to be able to do a comprehensive detailed process where I, I get to the end of a game and think it, it's the best game that I could have made to deal to deal with the problem. I think, you know, the real world always gives us uh, a range of constraints on what we can do. And it would just be nice to, to have those lifted. I completely agree with Mike's uh, view on kind of technology. There's as, as a kind of like technical game designer, which is a lot of what I've I've been doing over the past four years. I, I feel that, you know, we, we are often very constrained by the limits of technology in terms of what designs can look like and in some ways that that takes us down a certain mental road that we repeat and i feel like you could you could come up with some really different thinking and out of the box game designs if, if we could have full access to, to what technology can provide us with um for both the execution and and you know as mike said like data capture analysis as well so yeah absolutely um there are definitely times i wish i was like I could have done this game 
you know, better if I had you know, six, seven more months or uh, more than three months in total, right? <laughs> uh, so Chris, uh, what's your, your dream game? Uh, so for me, it would be about player engagement. And I find it so frustrating that um, sort of in the commercial, uh, uh, like almost the video game market, you have this incredible technology and these incredible graphics and designs. And if you could put something like virtual reality into a game that would just completely sell players on what they're doing and, and really immerse them in it in a completely different way, it almost create like, like a real fear and a real tension. Um, and then to be able to, to see how people behave um, when you factor in um, that that deep deep immersion through technology would be absolutely incredible. Uh, I believe your game will definitely require some psychological waivers uh, to be involved, <laughs> but it sounds great. As a designer, I'm all about immersion and getting your players involved. Um, so with that note, I see no other questions, and I would like to thank you guys all again, Mike, James, and Chris, for your wonderful time and sharing your expertise and sort of sharing your insights with us um, on this you know, I mean, evening for you and sort of afternoon for us. And we really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone.